And I, there we go. All right, welcome everyone to the RJOS Advocacy 102. Um, for those of you that tuned in last month, we had a great webinar with Dr. Doug Lendy uh, from the Orthopad Government Affairs Committee, who um, gave us a great introduction into what advocacy means within orthopedics and the musculoskeletal research um, and where our money goes when we um, actually put it into an orthopac. This second time around, what we're doing is having a uh, conversation uh, with Dr. K. Kirkpatrick, who is an orthopedic surgeon, and he's now on the other side um, um, doing uh, as a politician herself. Uh, so Dr. K. Kirkpatrick, she graduated from the University of Kentucky and was the first woman in her orthopedic program in Louisville. Uh, while in medical school, she uh, was involved in the AMA student section board. Um, and when she graduated fellowship and arrived in Atlanta, there was only one other female orthopedic surgeon there. Um, and so she understood the importance of mentorship. Uh, and to speak personally, I got to know Dr. K. Kirkpatrick Patrick through RJOS as a medical student myself, um, I was assigned to her and um, stalked her in the operating room. And I think I emailed her once a year, once I got into residency to say, I really want a job at Resurgence. Um, and <laughs> thankfully she remembered me, um, even though uh, Dr. Doug Lundy was president at the time. Um, Dr. K. Kirkpatrick served 12 years as co-president of Resurgence and was the first female pre president of the Georgia Orthopedic Society since 1954. Um, she's also served on the ASSH Council for three years, um, chair of the Georgia State Workers' Comp Medical Committee for five years, and has also been a member of RJOS for many, many years. Um, her husband's an ER doc, is also retired. Um, she has two grown children, an architect and an engineer. There's so many amazing things, but currently she serves as the uh, representative to the 32nd District here in Georgia, and that includes uh, North Central Cobb and West Cherokee. Uh, while serving, she's been on the chairman. She's been the chairman of the Senate Veterans Military Homeland Security Committee, the ex officio of the Senate Appro um, Appropriations Committee, a member of the Senate Health and Human Services Insurance and Labor and Judiciary Committees and Committees and Committees and knows everything there is to know about orthopedics, advocacy, running for office. And that is why I've invited her today so that we can get an inside um, peek in how to make that transition, what that transition was like. So thank you so much, Dr. Patrick for joining us today. Thank you, Letitia. And uh, it's so great for somebody that I took on as a mentee on behalf of the Academy to see you turn into such a great leader. And I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you. So, you know, let's get started. Um, you know, my interest in advocacy began um, through my relationship with Dr. Doug Lundy at Resurgence. But, you know, how did you get interested in um, advocacy as an orthopedic surgeon, especially being in private practice? Uh, what initially sparked that interest for you? Well, as, as you and I have discussed, my leadership experience kind of goes way back. And I actually learned a lot during my time as a medical student with my involvement with the AMA. They taught us a lot of things, um, public speaking and uh, how to get things done in the political system and so on. So I kind of knew that, but then during residency and fellowship, all you're doing is working. So I let go of it. But when I joined my partner in private practice, he encouraged me to join the medical society. And about that time in the late eighties, my colleague, Dr. Tom Price got elected to the state Senate. And we had a big fight in Georgia about tort reform because our malpractice premiums were out of control. And he was leading the effort on that and was also in my group. So the tort reform bill passed by one vote in the state legislature. And so I kind of saw the impact that a physician could make. And then I have another old friend from my AMA days, Dr. John Barrasso, who's also an orthopedic surgeon who happens to be the US Senator for uh, Wyoming. And he and I have kept in touch. I've tracked his political career as he's gone on and he's still there. So I didn't have a lot of female role models in orthopedics back in the day, but I have to give a shout out to Dr. Edie Hunter Griffin she worked at Peachtree Orthopedics. I think she still does, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, 
she and I met as the only two women orthopedists in Atlanta every three months for breakfast. And she would give me the lay of the land and how she dealt with her kids and her practice and worked it all in. And uh, so she was a big inspiration to me. And then, you know, it just kind of went on from there. So how would you, for the, the surgeon who's in private practice, that's, um, you know, speaking up to myself, that's just starting out within the first five to seven years, uh, what are some of the ways that you would um, tell them to get involved um, within the political scheme, within um, advocacy, so they could stand up for their patients? Well, there's one easy way and one way that's a little bit harder. The easy way, and I always felt this was really important to be represented by organizations that had a bigger voice. And so I joined everything. I joined the Medical Association, the AAOS, the AMA, the Hand Society, the Georgia Orthopedic Society, the Georgia Society for Surgery of the Hand, and, and, and just on and on. And the total, I think I belong to 12 different things at one point. And the total dues were around five grand a year, which sounded like a lot of money when I was younger. And it's still a lot of money, but I thought of it as my overhead, part of my overhead, part of the cost of doing business. And it's a good way to stay not only educated, about what's going on in the political arena that impacts practice, but also it, uh, they will represent you whether you do anything or not. And mm -hmm. so I thought that was really important. And then as I got older and grew in my practice, I said yes to every leadership opportunity that came along. There's this whole culture of saying no to everything, but I'm a big advocate for saying yes, because it leads to opportunities that you would miss if you said no. And then the other thing that's a little bit harder, but not that hard, is getting relationships with your elected officials at all levels. And it's not that hard to do. The societies can help you do that, but I did everything from hosting fundraisers to calling them about important issues the key thing was to meet with them, not necessarily during the session, but when they weren't so busy and get to know them and to get their cell phone number. That was really the key. So that when, if somebody calls me that I know, I'm much more likely to pay closer attention to what they say than if I've never heard of them. And then after that, when I became president of Resurgence, I was at the Capitol from time to time or wherever advocating for our physicians and our patients. And so I kind of learned, got a little bit more of an inside look about how the process worked. And many times I would have to cancel my clinic and run down there to testify in front of a committee. So that's yet another level, but um, it really makes a huge difference. So I'm certainly an advocate for, um, getting engaged in the process. And you know, you made a great point, Dr. Kirkpatrick, which is sometimes we think that these officials are unreachable, but we truly do hold a weight with that MD or DO at the end of our name. Um, and like you said, asking for cell phone numbers or email addresses and reaching out, it's its so rare that they have um, their constituents even reach out, especially, you know, a physician that's in their area, they're immediately going to pick up the phone and they'll save your number. Um, and that was very surprising to me when I got into advocacy that, and they'll remember you. You know, when you when you go down to the Capitol or you attend an event, they'll remember you just based on the fact that you're a physician or an orthopedic surgeon. So and that makes our, our voices heard um, even more. We are an amazing uh, resource for them. Uh, you know, oftentimes they're not familiar. You are, of course, because you're a surgeon, but um, the, the majority of them are not familiar with the one on one um, patient interactions and issues that our patients um, go through on a daily basis. So if we do not stand up and advocate and call and write letters and get involved, like you say, um, they, they really wouldn't know about it. Well, meanwhile, they have people that are lobbying from all different areas that are constantly um, you know, in their ear. They do need to hear from us. Yeah, yeah, and it's not very difficult at the state level because it's, you know, those people are local and they really care about their constituents because that's who's voting for them. 
Right. And they care even more about somebody who's worked for their campaign or written them a check or something like that. But it's not very difficult. At the federal level, it's really important to, it's easiest to get to know the staff. So mm -hmm. in other words, to find out who their healthcare staff person is. But at the state level and also even federal, everybody's got an area of expertise. So I know more about healthcare than I do about banking or farming or, you know, a hundred other things, but there are experts on that that are representing their districts. So I'm representing 191,562 people and all the senators are representing the same size district. The house districts are smaller, mm -hmm. but um, nevertheless, it's pretty easy to get in touch with people at the state level. So I'd encourage everybody to do that. Excellent. So that kind of takes us to the next question. Um, when, how, where, why did you make the decision to run for office? That is a, a pretty lofty um, aspiration. How did that come about? Well, the why part, I still ask myself pretty much every day. But um, what happened was that I decided to retire after I'd been in private practice for 30 years. It seemed like a nice round number. I had some other things I wanted to do. Politics was not one of them. And um, this is what happens a lot of times. A door opens. And uh, in this case, the state senator in my area decided to run for Congress which left an open seat in my district. So I started getting calls because people knew I was retiring and they knew about my background in leadership. And people were saying, you should run, we need more doctors in the state legislature, blah, blah, blah. And because of the timing, uh, I was able to say yes. And that may be the one time that I'm sorry I said yes, but uh, not really, I'm, I'm sort of kidding, sort of not. Yeah. <laughs> I had not really planned to do this, but I was just going to work on my golf game and travel and things like that. But this seemed like an opportunity to make a bigger difference. Mm. We have more people rather than just one patient at a time um, or one interaction at a time. And in fact, it has turned out that way. I didn't know really enough about what I was getting into as either a candidate or an elected official. I knew a little bit about the process but uh, it was an eye-opening experience. And um, looking back, had I had all the information, I don't know if I would have still said yes, but it's, it's been interesting. I've met a whole lot of great people that I would not have met otherwise. I've been able to get some great legislation passed on behalf of patients. I fight with the insurance companies every single day and they just are waiting to see what I'm bringing next. And um, so I think it's worth it, but there's a lot of sacrifice that goes with it. I can imagine. Um, so, you know, what is one thing that you wish you knew before your run for office? Well, you know, in the world of healthcare, it's a pretty positive environment. And I'm sorry, you all have had to deal with COVID for the last two years, but other than that, your patients typically like you, they listen to what you say, they respect you, you ask the right questions to get to a diagnosis, you get the right people in the room, you make a decision and you go. Well, it doesn't work like that in campaigns and it also doesn't work like that in politics. No. And it's more about relationships than it is about policy many times. So there were eight people in my race, my first, very first election in 2017. And three of us were docs, five Republicans, three Democrats. And here we run every two years. And so I'm in my sixth election in five years because I had a runoff the first time. And now I had a primary this year, which I've never had before. So um, I've always thought that humility was a great quality for a leader. But what I found out was that that doesn't really work very well as a political candidate, because you have to be able to self-promote and tell your story. And I found that to be very unnatural and hard. And it took a lot of practice to where I was comfortable with that. And also the process was really expensive and it's not, I had to raise a lot of money 
and if you're not used to asking people for money um, or being gone from home almost every night because of some event or another, that was a big adjustment. So I wish I'd understood more about what's involved with being a candidate and how much time I was gonna be away from home. And what would you say surprised you the most once you were in office um, and, and you were starting to, you know, kind of get the, the lay of the land? What surprised you uh, now that you were in this position? Well, before I even got there, I had a couple of surprises that I'll just mention briefly. I had a negative attack from one of the doctors in my election the first time uh, in my own party, uh, Republican Party, starting with my name. So like many of you, I have an uh, interesting combination of names. So my maiden name is Kirkpatrick. My married name is Haltom. So when we got married, my husband said, if you don't change your name, I'm going to change mine. And I'm like, no. Um, so I ended up practicing under my maiden name, but officially changing my name to my married name. So my opponent uh, filed a complaint with the state election board to get me disqualified because my voter registration was messed up or whatever. So that cost $10,000 to get a lawyer to straighten that out. Wow. And then he also, the same guy, um, when I was a leader at Resurgence, we had a giving program, a PAC, not a PAC, but we all donated money to uh, people that we thought were friendly to our issues. And it was on both sides of the aisle. It was a bipartisan program. And so this guy pulled out my donation history and some of the checks were personal checks because you can't write corporate checks for federal races. Right. And so I had donations to Republicans, Democrats, everybody. And this guy did a whole series of mailers about my donation history. So. That was, you don't see this stuff coming, but uh, when I got down there, um, first of all, you think you have a thick skin as a female orthopedist, mm. but turns out it needs to be thicker. Wow. And people uh, call you very unpleasant names, sometimes very creative. Mm. People behind a computer screen think they can say anything to you. And uh, so that was, a big surprise. And the other surprise was that people uh, sometimes in elected office will lie to your face and they'll uh, tell you you're going to, they're going to do one thing and then they do something else. And it was very disappointing, but um, that, you know, that's, that's life. And you learn that, make that mistake one time. Right. And, and then you never believe a word they say again. So um, there's a lot about that. I wish I had spent a little more time instead of reading bills in my office because I'm a detail freak as a surgeon, right? So, mm. I mean, they're trying to understand the words of everything. And I should have been chatting up the person who's chair of the committee where my bill was gonna go. So the relationship thing is real. The good news is doctors are good communicators by and large, and right. that's very helpful. And that, that's a great segue because the next question is going to be, what advice do you give to those um, who want to run for office or seek office either at, you know, their local, state, federal level? Um, well, I've got a few pointers, but first, let me just say that um, as a doctor who's also uh, representing a lot of people that are doctors and a lot of people who aren't doctors, there's a narrow path to walk because you kind of have to balance being a doctor and seeing everything through doctor eyes with being viewed as a special interest mm. advocate who only cares about one thing and you know we're voting on everything and so healthcare is just one small piece of it and so even though you're viewed as an expert to some degree you also are viewed with suspicion if you're advocating for your own industry. So that said, um, I think running for office, if you have that calling or that desire or that burning flame that you wanna make a big difference, it's all about timing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got to be sure that your family is on board, that your partners are on board and that your finances are squared away because most state legislatures, at least, we make 20, about $20,000 a year. 
And um, so there's a lot of turnover because people can't live on $20,000 a year by and large. And right. so they, they'll serve for a few years and then they'll bail out and go back to their day job. Um, but you really, most of the state legislatures are in session for, we're in session for three months in Georgia. And so you're pretty much toast during that time. You can't really go anywhere and you are not home a whole lot. So there's a big time commitment and a young woman orthopedist called me, maybe she wasn't an orthopedist, but anyway, she was a doctor and she said, uh, yeah, I really want to run for this open house seat. And she has two little kids, a husband who's a doctor and she's in a three person group. And so I was thinking and said to her, how's that going to work? I mean, what is your partners say about that? Are they going to cover you? Are they going to subsidize you? What's your husband say? Who's going to take care of the kids and all these things. So a lot of things have to line up and it's sort of like you just have to figure out what the right time is if you want to do that. And it might not be now, but it might be three or four years from now. Seats open up all the time. Um, the other thing is you kind of have to be ready for the negativity mm. in that environment, which is completely different. And um, it's kind of a balance of listening and also not taking it personally, which I'm still not very good at that part. But here's the point. If good people don't run, you leave it to the crazy people. Right. And right. So if anyone is the least bit interested or has a situation that they think might lend itself well to running for office, I am more than happy to talk to individuals and I'm pretty easy to find. I'm happy for people to have my email address and cell phone number if you want to share it. Absolutely. Because sometimes you just have to kind of talk through that, um, your personal situation and figure out how that works. And you, you'll you have a lot of help if you decide to do that. But I've never assumed that anyone else was going to help me, just like I never assumed anybody was going to help me in my practice. Um, you kind of have to make it work on your own. And um, that's that's what I did. And, you know, you, you spoke on this a little bit, and I, I saved this question for last because I think it's the hardest thing. Like, how difficult is it for you to represent your own interests, to represent the interests of your constituents. And then on top of that, you're an orthopedic surgeon. So you're also listening to, you know, the opinions of your, your colleagues. How do you balance all of that when it comes to you making decisions um, in your position? Well, I think the number one part for a physician in, in legislative uh, job is to always keep the patients at the forefront because nobody feels sorry for doctors. I can tell you that right now, because mostly as much as the challenges that we have, we make a decent living. Yeah. And um, so people still tend to view us as um, interested in our own profitability, if you will. And uh, I think if we keep the patients out there, that's a big help. But most state legislatures, as I mentioned, are part-time. And so everybody's got an area of expertise. And so everybody's got an agenda. So whether you're coming from the, uh, you're a trial lawyer or you're an insurance agent, or you're a, uh, you know, someone in agriculture or whatever you are, you bring a point of view. And so that's normal. It's not, it's not a bad thing because because people need, there's so much going on with healthcare right now that people need to um, have someone that they trust to bounce things off of. And so myself and the other three doctors in the Senate out of 56, which is amazing, um, are viewed as, we call ourselves the doctor caucus. And there's only one doctor on the house side, but he meets with us too about every couple of weeks. So we kind of put our heads together on what's going on with healthcare legislation and the approach that we want to take because we want to present kind of a united front. But um, there are other 
issues about taxes and economic development and just the whole gamut of things, social issues um, that you just have to balance your constituency for your district, your own point of view, and then the kind of the greater good. Right. And so it's very tricky. And uh, I don't know that anybody does a perfect job of that, but at the end of the day, you have to be able to look in the mirror. Exactly. Love it. That was, um, that was wonderful. I'm going to open this up for questions. And we already have one here that says, what are you most proud of that you have done since you began, began your service in the Georgia State Legislature? Um, well, I can talk about a couple of bills, but I think what I'm most proud of is that I've been able through my work and um, kind of my approach and communication skills to be viewed by people on both sides of the aisle as somebody trustworthy who will tell the truth and uh, be reasonable and be willing to listen. And what that means, because they know I've done the research, when I stand in the well to present a bill, they know that I know what I'm talking about. And so my bills tend to pass, um, which is, that's a good thing. So I had a bill uh, where we had a a local charity whose sandwich program, summer lunch program got shut down by the Department of Public Health for some technicality. And that was going to mean a bunch of kids were not going to have food in the summer when they're out of school. And so the charity ended up spending an extra $250,000 to buy sandwiches that year because of what had happened. So I worked with the Department of Public Health, the charity the Department of Agriculture and a bunch of other folks. And after nine months, finally got a solution and got that bill passed. And um, that, so that makes a difference in my community. And so I'm really proud of that. And then the other thing is I got a huge prior authorization bill passed mm -hmm. last year that is cutting edge uh, in the country of putting timelines, putting transparency, um, putting the, some accountability on the insurance companies to, um, for some consequences for bad behavior and so on. And so um, that was Senate Bill 80, that was 22 page bill and it passed on the last day of the session. And then I added to it this year and I'll have another step for the companies that I haven't talked to them about yet this coming session. So I do think it's important because our, our uh, system is so complicated, really hard for patients to navigate, really right. hard for doctors to navigate. And it's almost like the Wizard of Oz. There's somebody behind the curtain who's making all these decisions. Nobody knows who they are or how they're making the decisions. And so I am a consumer advocate and try to bring transparency to state government. And, you know, that's what's so great about, um, you know, you running for office is that your inside perspective into these issues with prior authorization, when you share it with someone who doesn't have a background in healthcare, it just sounds like a bunch of blah, 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 you know, like they, they don't understand how much it impacts, you know, our patients getting access, getting better healthcare. Um, so everyone that's listening, you know, you can take something, a problem that you deal with and find solutions um, by running for office. So, you know, I really do applaud you um, in doing that. Let's see, we've, someone asked literally the next question is <laughs> discuss what you're most proud of. Um, let's see, we think I have one more here. Can you tell us where we can review your prior authorization bill? Yep, you can go to senate.ga.gov and there's a search function and you can look up SB80 on there and it should pop up. And if that doesn't work, there's an advanced search where you can put in prior authorization and it should pop up. Or if you have trouble, just email me and I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about working down there and nobody asked me this, but I'm a, I just thought of it, is that many of the bills that we pass are bipartisan and many of them fly through almost unanimously or, or unanimously but those are not in the newspaper, typically. The things that hit the paper are the sexy issues 
the social issues, people, people are things people are really fired up about. And one of the things that I have learned is that in a situation like the state legislature or Congress or even the local um, municipal offices, really you can be with somebody on something and against them on something else. But as long as you can maintain a dialogue and a relationship, you can still advance your issues. But once you burn the bridge and make an enemy out of somebody, there's really no turning back from that. And that can really hurt you from an advocacy standpoint. And that is why um, everyone who's dealing with elected officials needs to be respectful and be sure that you're listening as well as talking. Uh, I like when people come to see me for them to um, leave something written, concise with me that I can refer back to because we may not be voting on their issue today. It may be a month from now. And so that's very helpful. But I think that whole respect thing is just as true in politics as it is in healthcare. Absolutely. Thank you so much for emphasizing that because, uh, you know, I think we sometimes forget that and that there's a human who is <laughs> sitting in the seat. And like you said earlier, you've had everything at the book thrown at you. And, uh, you know, it can hurt a little bit more when it comes from your colleagues. Um, you know, that's, I would imagine that that stings a little more. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, we have the Q&A, the chat open, because if I don't receive anything within the next 30 seconds, I'm going to then assume um, that all questions have been um, answered. Let me just roll, scroll through here one more time, make sure I haven't missed anyone. Yeah, I think, yep. I think all questions have been answered. Thank you so much, Dr. Kirkpatrick. This has been um, very eye-opening, giving us an inside perspective in the, the pros and cons of running for office, your own personal experience, how you continue to advocate um, you know, for um, orthopedic surgery, for our patients, for musculoskeletal health in general. We really do appreciate you and, and speaking up for all of these issues. Um, I can, if anyone wants to know Dr. Kirkpatrick's email, um, I can share it. He actually, you, yeah, let me make sure I have it up here. Okay, let's double check. I have a new computer, everyone, so please bear with me as I'm, I'm learning my own technology. Okay, so that is K A Y K A R K K I R K. K-I-R-K, thank you, P-A-T-R-I-C-K-M-D at gmail.com. I'll repeat that again. K-A-Y-K-I-R-K-P-A-T-R-I-C-K-M-D at gmail.com. So thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you um, being here, speaking with us. And if anyone has any other questions, you can feel free to email Dr. Kirkpatrick or myself or um, through our JOS. Thank you. Right. See you. Everyone have a great night. Bye-bye.